Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you may be watching this. Um, I'm delighted to welcome today to the Leaders' Lounge Anne Sheehan, Thank you, General Sinead. Manager of Microsoft Ireland. Um, I know we've been waiting quite a long time to speak to Anne, and I'm delighted she's here. Um, one of the leading females in Ireland in STEM, probably in the world in STEM, and I'd be delighted to kind of delve down into your journey so far, Anne. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Sinead. And great to see you again. It's a while since we caught up. <laughs> it has been a while. It was a previous life for yourself. But yeah, we'll get yeah, to that for discussion. sure. Yeah. Um, so on that topic, Anne, do you want to just try and introduce yourself to the audience and the journey you've been on um, from, from the start up to general manager? Yeah, Microsoft? great. Um, so I guess I started my career uh, in IBM. Um, and went into IBM as a grad and did 16 fantastic years there and actually did a wide variety of roles from marketing to sales, um, also in the services business. So mm -hmm. what was fantastic was I kind of did something different every two or three years. So mm -hmm. I feel even though I was there 16 years, which is a long time, I probably had four or five different careers and I, and I grew up within IBM. Um, and I think a lot of the you know, great attributes and values they have, you know, have always stayed with me. But I really did grow up there because I went from like, you know, an individual contributor to vice president in that mm -hmm. 16 years. So you do kind of grow, change, shape, evolve in, in that whole period. And that's probably the period of my career where I grew I, probably the most. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then I made a decision, skipping kind of on, I made a decision after 16 years to leave IBM, which was really unusual at the time because nobody I guess left nobody left IBM mm. nobody left IBM you know back then it was the biggest technology company in the world um, I had got to vice president level mm. I was probably one of the youngest female vice presidents in Europe um, and I remember when I made the decision to leave it was like is she just you know what, mm. what's gone wrong mm. and actually the reason which I think is very relevant today the reason that I left was really my values and the values of the company had, were starting to kind of go okay. two different ways. And I think for me, I've always been clear, even, you know, much younger in my days, what, what's, what works for me and what mm -hmm. doesn't. And when I think back now, the decision was, you know, I just kind of suddenly felt I was doing things that maybe weren't natural, were a little bit unnatural. Okay. So I made the decision um, uh, to leave and I went from tech to telco, which most people go telco to tech. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the reason I did that, and I remember feeling really scared actually, because when you grow up in one organization, you build a brand. And I, mm. I remember thinking to myself, you're that kind of inner person that talks to you going, are you only good because you've been with one organization and People know, you know, if you get Anne involved, things will happen yeah. and, you know, all the rest yeah. of it. Um, and therefore, I really wanted to test myself to yeah. say, you know, can I go to a different industry, different company where you have to rebuild your brand all over again? And I went to a job that was a lot smaller than the job I was doing. Okay. So I had all those things coming at me when I decided to make the decision to leave, to go from IBM to Vodafone, which was like, what are you doing? You're going backwards in your career, uh, all mm -hmm. the rest of it. And mm -hmm. that. To People me, are great at giving advice, aren't they? They are, but I never, I never view position or level as going backwards. Yeah. To me, it's like, am I going to learn? Am I going to test myself? Can I add value? So I don't care whether it's managing two people, five people, 10,000 people. That's, I've always been really clear. So that noise in the system about Anne's going from being a vice president to a director, she's going from managing yeah. thousands of people in the Nordics to a few hundred people in Ireland. I actually didn't care, right? Okay. I was more about, you know, will, you know, am I just brand and that's IBM. And I remember, um, and it was Vodafone Ireland I went to, and I remember stand, they have a beautiful building mm. um, in Leopardstown. I remember standing outside the first day going, oh my Lord, like you're literally back to day one. Mm. And mm. you know, you're, you, you know, nobody knows you. Mm. And that was fantastic, actually. It was just honestly, about a week or two in, I went, wow, I can just, you know, rewrite what brand Anne wow. is about. So I took like the best parts I think that I had. And then I learned some amazing things, you know, working with Anne O'Leary and just different leaders in, in, mm -hmm. in, um, in Vodafone. And, and it was great to go into a different industry, learn mm -hmm. more about the consumer business, learn more about brand, bringing actual products to market, which, you know, happens a lot in telco, learning about legacy, how you run a network. And actually the biggest thing for me was Sometimes when you're more in B2B and enterprise, mm -hmm. you don't really understand or appreciate what you're delivering, how, the impact on, on the customer. When, when I went to telco and like, if somebody's network isn't working, 
You know, if you can't make a phone call, the impact Mm. um, on people's lives that connectivity brings. So I loved getting exposure to kind of consumer um, business. So yeah, I learned a lot and then went to the UK. Uh, with Vodafone. With Vodafone, yeah. Okay. And that was a fantastic experience because that actually was, I t- up till then, had done a high growth um, and the UK was a turnaround. So that's well publicised that, that Vodafone UK um, wasn't in a great place and they put in a team to do the turnaround and that was quite incredible. Because actually there I learned, you know, what happens when you don't look after your customers, you know, you, you lose focus for what's core to the company, how a business can just, you know, you know, go like that. And that was incredible, actually, to rebuild a business and a brand. And that's what we did, me with, um, you know, the rest of the general management team in Vodafone UK was to rebuild that and over how, four years. And how did they take to an Irish woman coming in to the UK to turn their It's a great question. Around? Actually, and I remember when um, Nick Jeffrey, who was the CEO, at the time said, Anne, I want you to come join and do this turnaround. And I thought, God, but I'm Irish, mm, right? Mm. And he was just like, irrelevant. Um, okay. And it was irrelevant. Actually, and actually, you know, I did, with my IBM experience, you know, I had kind of worked in a lot of different, you know, Global. with different nationalities, different countries. I think at the end of the day, it is as a leader about what you stand for. Um, okay. And, you know, what your values are and are you doing what you'd say you did? I mean, we, you know, there was a lot of work we had to do with our customers in the UK. And I was just open and transparent around okay. the turnaround, what we would do, what we would deliver. Um, and, you know, I just... A I lot of acknowledging it. mistakes, was it? For or? sure. Okay. For okay. sure. Humility. I mean, look, if, you, if things aren't going well, then there's no point being defensive, right? It was yeah. about acknowledging it and then genuinely and sincerely working really hard yeah. with the team yeah. to make things better. And I think customers saw that and appreciated it. And I absolutely loved the UK market. I loved the scale, the size. The customers were brilliant to deal with. Yeah. Loads of Irish. There is, yeah. Uh, yeah. Loads of Irish um, and loads of Irish doing really great things. So, yeah, never... And you uprooted family to go yeah, and move to? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, you know, to to really immerse yourself in, mm. in the market, you kind of have to be there and you have to, you know, be That's part of their culture and, and all that. But, uh, yeah, it was a great experience. And then... Um, I went from telco back to tech. And in the middle of a global pandemic, you, you moved to, of a, back to Microsoft September 21. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and was I that think, something that, that, that came to you or was it, um, a, again, just a, a, a change that you needed? It was a bit of both, actually. I kind of felt I was coming up to kind of nine, going into my, my tenth year in, in Vodafone. And I mean, what a, it's an, it is an amazing company. And mm. I say that with sincerity. Mm. To me, it was more an industry change. Mm. So I was kind of looking to say, like, I love innovating, working with customers to do something different, to drive real change, market making. And I was kind of looking at the next five, six years in telco, and I just kind of went, do you know what? I think I've brought everything I can bring to the industry. Okay. Um, and you know, I am high energy, high passion. Uh, absolutely And I energy. just, for me, I'm either all in yeah. or I'm not. And I just felt I've given everything, and you know, it's time for somebody else to come in and take kind of what I had done to the next level. And I, I've always admired Microsoft. I had read Satya's book. Yeah. Um, and it was like the first book I read from a global CEO that really talked about culture. Yes. So it didn't talk yes. about like, you know, we're growing this, that and the other, right? This was about how he has changed the culture of an organization, how he himself, you know, as the CEO truly understands technology and how you you know, what technology, how it can enable good, it can drive change, and by having the right culture where people can come as they are and do as they love, right, really has just changed the company. Mm. And I read the book, you're going to laugh at this, I read the book in about three days, and then I read it again. And I was just like, oh, my God, what an amazing uh, company. And then... Th- was this before you yeah. even... Yeah, okay. And then the wow. call came about three months later. You couldn't write it. Serendipity. You couldn't write it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's a great, you know, Katrina was a great yes, um, yes, GM yeah. and Katrina was, I mean, she'd done eight or nine years, yeah, so she's gone yeah. on to the next ch- chapter in her, in her life and career. And it's an incredible business in Ireland because yeah. the site in Ireland is the only one of its kind outside of the US. So it's just, a, you know, an honour, actually. And, and, you know, the same little person on your shoulder goes, oh, wow, what if, you know? I know. Um, but I, that little person on your shoulder, is that another word for imposter syndrome? Yeah. I, it's interesting. Um, 
It's nothing like it used to. I mean, that the, the move from IBM to Vodafone was a bigger one. I think, you know, the more, I don't know, is experience, is it age? You know, I'm, you know, coming up on the... <laughs> Does it? We Does won't, it? We won't no. say it. Um, uh, therefore, I, you know, I felt actually, you know, I can really, I can really be part of the Microsoft family. I think I can bring my passion and energy. And I actually wrote a, a quick blog two months in, and I was thinking to myself, why am I enjoying this so much? Mm -hmm. Right? Is it mm -hmm. the great technology? Is mm -hmm. it Microsoft? Is it the team? And actually, probably for one of the first times in my career, like I'm like enthusiastic mm -hmm. by nature. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, Sinead, if you've ever had this, but sometimes as a female, when you're like passionate, enthusiastic, people go, gosh. Yeah. And I felt like when I joined Microsoft, it just was like embraced. And I didn't feel like, okay, you know, I have to kind of calm things down or be a bit more presidential. I just was like- You could be yourself. Could be myself, really great. and truly. So, and that's probably the first time I've really experienced that so early on in joining. An organization so I just went it's it's quite refreshing actually and does that speak to the I mean you mentioned culture a few times there you mentioned values a few times there does yeah. that speak to the culture and values and what are the core values of yourself and Microsoft yeah I think for for Microsoft the mission is about helping every person and organization you know evolve mm -hmm. and change um, mm -hmm. um, in the world right and therefore to do that you need all sorts of everything, don't you? You need different um, cultures, backgrounds, perspectives, personalities, whatever, right? It doesn't mm. really matter. Mm. And therefore, I think, you know, the focus is more on brilliant, brilliant technology for mm -hmm. our customers. And therefore, Microsoft just wants the best people in the world, the most curious people, people that will experiment, that have humility, that go, you know, I probably didn't get that right. Because to create brilliant things, right, you have, you don't get it right first time. And therefore, I find the focus is on that, okay. right, as opposed to, you know, you're a bit enthusiastic or you're a bit loud or you're a bit that and the other. And I find that really refreshing. And therefore, I've just been just amazed by the quality of people. And it's got a real learning culture. Yeah. And I love, I am learning so much, you know, and self-educating myself, right, doing, like I've done my cloud accreditation. I'm not technical, right? But to create space, like it really encourages and we encourage our colleagues at Microsoft to create space and time for learning. Because okay. if we're not learning, okay. how can we expect to help our customers? Yeah. So I think being curious and learning, which I love, is, is a real value. And, and do you think some of that kind of permission, permission to fail, I'm going to say, or, or, or innovation comes from being a, a US multinational? Because I, I do a lot of travel to the US and I yeah. find that they are just much more... I mean, what do they say? A failed entrepreneur in the US is an yeah. entrepreneur. A failed entrepreneur yeah, in Ireland yeah. is a failure. I, is it coming from, from the top down? I think I don't think it's it's kind of because we're a US multinational, right? I think it's if you I think it's from Satya Judson, yeah. Amy Hood. I think you know, they've created, and then the leaders, you know, yeah. that permutates out obviously an environment where you know to be the very best for our customers, you have to experiment. You have okay. to be curious. Okay. I mean, we want to solve. Um, you know the challenges that face our customers globally to do yeah. that you've got to ask the right questions yeah. you've got to trial test learn and I think it's about failure if you're going to fail fail fast move on but a key thing to and, and not specific to Microsoft I think just for me in general humility I mean I, I'm mm. not perfect right mm. you are not perfect I think you know I don't want to ever be part of a team or a leader who just doesn't acknowledge that so I'm very open with my team Mm. You know, they all know what Anne's strengths and weaknesses mm. are. I don't call them weaknesses. I think things that I don't like doing. I should okay. Sinead, okay. say that. <laughs> it's very um, And I don't always get it right. And therefore, I think if, if as a leader, you're open about that, then you create a, you know, psychological safety. And what does that yeah. mean, right? It's yeah. a big word. It means where people feel safe to go, I actually didn't get it right. Or I've got a problem. Or we need to look at this then you get real, I think you get, that's when you get real high performance and when businesses really thrive mm -hmm. and people really thrive. Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, and back to the kind of, you asked me about the values for me, I mean, they're not that complicated for me. For me, the first is, and they're not in any particular order, is always about customer. I, I always want to okay. work with organizations that care about the customer to okay. the good and the bad, right? Yeah. The second is people right that like there's an environment i can create an environment or i'm in an environment myself where people can really thrive mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. right? I think mm -hmm. that's super, mm -hmm. super important. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of underneath that, you've got just trust and integrity and honesty. That's hugely yeah. important for me. And then fun. I have a huge sense of fun. And I think if we're not having fun, like I kind of, now maybe I'm in the honeymoon period, I'm eight months in, like I bounce into yeah. work or I bounce out of the bed in the morning and go, and it's not like that, you know, days yeah. aren't hard, right? Yeah. They are hard. But I, you know, I just love, I think a sense of fun is just so important. Well, I'm smiling because we have five values, core values for Grant Thornton. And one of our values is fun. Oh, right. But it actually was the value that probably got the most discussion at a partner level because there was discussion of, can fun really be a value? Yeah, and, you know, I know. You know, does it make it sound like we're taking things not so seriously? But what it means is it's, enjoyment, it's yeah. celebration, it's a sense of belonging, it's and fun means different things to different yeah, people. So I, I agree. completely, yeah. completely I think it's just incredibly you. important. I mean, if we don't celebrate the successes and acknowledge the failures, right? Mm. And do it mm. in a way where you're respectful, where people kind of enjoy even a difficult conversation. So we were I was with my team at an offset last week and yeah, there was like some difficult mm -hmm. discussions, right? Mm -hmm. But actually one of them said to me afterwards, like really enjoyed that. Okay. And we had a bit of fun. And that's th that's yeah. high trust, high challenge, isn't it, Shane? Yeah. Where yeah. you can have those discussions and at the end of it, you look, people look back and say, like, it was a good discussion. And yeah. you know, we had a bit of fun. So yeah, I just, well it's done. a word I use well a lot. Yeah. That's brilliant. And come here, you talked about innovation and creativity and, and bringing yourself to work and all that. In the pandemic and we were all in lockdown and you started a new job in lockdown how a how did that affect you or did it affect you good or bad and b keen to hear about microsoft i mean they've done huge global research on hybrid working mm -hmm. and what that means for the future um talk to me a little yeah. bit about that i think so first of all i mean i was a i was kind of in but i was lockdown started in in the vodafone world and then okay. kind of finished in the microsoft world i have to say i mean i am an extreme extrovert you are an extreme extrovert. so I can tell it you was say that. very hard for yeah. me I found actually whilst like I was going through you know like working like long hours like everybody did but I found actually it was it was more it took more yeah. energy for me to be at home in the one room all mm. day long mm. than actually if I'm buzzing around an mm. office or buzzing with customers. Mm. So I really, I found myself exhausted. And like I have okay. energy, as you know, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Coming out mm -hmm. my ears, right? Mm -hmm. it, to the point actually probably too much energy. I found myself exhausted mm. at a Friday evening and really, you know, I really, I really didn't like it. I have okay. to say, I okay. really didn't like it. Like I adapted like everybody yeah, yeah. else. Yeah. Um, but I found myself just, craving um mm -hmm. uh the energy of people oh my god like absolutely mm. like i found myself in supermarkets like randomly anyone that would look at me i talked to like i really did and i actually found that really therapeutic an irish person in the uk doing that I it know, is relatively yeah, for scary. sure and in and an irish person even doing it in ireland <laughs> is even funnier but i yeah i have to say i whilst i i think look the flex life after COVID and the flexibility it's a game changer for everybody yeah. but put me mm. permanently working from home I just yeah not me and what so 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 if we look at kind of the I think what we've all accepted is that the hybrid is the world of the yeah. future and and there's probably a little bit of push pull between employers and employees sure. as to where the, the correct balance is um, so, so that's one thing I want to explore with you. Second thing is Microsoft has this amazing building, amazing, amazing building that building. they're known for. Yeah. What does that building now become? Because if people aren't coming to it, what what's does, it yeah, for? Yeah. So I guess take the the, the latter first. Yeah. Um, I think everybody's had to kind of relook at the meaning and the purpose of their buildings, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think in, in Microsoft for us now, actually it's about where people come to collaborate um, okay. to do kind of co-creation and to socialize, okay. right? And that socializing okay. and networking is super important because okay. to me, that's where often the best connections are made, yeah. the best ideas come. And I think, you know, we, in a post COVID world, there's still a pretty good buzz. I mean, our, you know, we're not back to where no. like the building, actually, to be honest, if we, we, the building couldn't cope if everybody just with the numbers of employees yeah. we have now and the numbers of, that have come in during COVID. But for us, though, that collaboration and co-creation mm -hmm. is still happening. And it's great to see that. Mm -hmm. But the socialising is as important. And people are coming in. Okay. They might come in on a Thursday um, and it might be to have lunch and a few coffees. 
Okay. Right. And okay. that's fantastic. And we're really encouraging it. Okay. Um, and I think, you know, there's, it is about empowering and trusting employ your employees, right? And mm. I think, you know, some of the stuff that we talked about in um, the survey, right? Mm. So the survey was interesting, right? Because the survey was done in 31 countries, 31,000 yeah. employees, 600 of which were, um, were in Ireland. And actually, the survey was done about, I think, two years ago. Um, and pay was right up at the top, right? Mm -hmm. Pay was like number seven or number eight. The biggest mm -hmm. thing was uh, culture was okay. number one. Um, health and well-being was number two, okay. right? Okay. And the third was this, um, I guess, kind of social contracting, right? Which was that wanting to be part of a community, not to be isolated. Um, and they were words used, actually, okay. like isolation, yeah, yeah, yeah. loneliness, right? Yeah. But um, you know, I think the stats were something like 58% of the Irish respondees were like, we will move if there is not a good company culture. So the biggest Gosh. learning was company culture, health and well-being, the desire for flexibility, the yeah. desire for employees to help on this kind of social connection now and how you bring people together are the top findings okay. and even more pronounced. Like Ireland, in, if we compare the stats that came out globally, was 5-10% even more pronounced on those. Um, and in therefore, Ireland? Yeah. Was it? And wow. therefore, you know, people will leave in the next 12 months if the company culture is not what they want it to be. So I think there's a lot of work that organisations have to do on what their culture is, what their values yeah. stand for, and to make sure that that's understood, appreciated and communicated. Yeah. Communication is Yeah. Key. And then the other part was around, you know, there is, uh, maybe in the past, employees felt, you know what, I'm a bit concerned about technologies, they're a big brother element. That did not feature. Actually, there was a desire for more digital tools mm -hmm. for employees to help them be more productive. And I think some of the work that we're doing in some of the tools, I won't go into the technology, like Viva, like an employee experience platform. So using data now that can actually be good for employees. So for example, if you know, I was chatting to one CEO, CEO recently who was saying, well, we've gotten verbatims back from a, you know, a kind of a pulse survey and mm -hmm. people are saying they're working too long hours or they're mm -hmm. not taking lunch breaks and mm -hmm. I don't really know. And I'm like, now employees are like, well, look at my data. So mm -hmm. our Viva tool can run and say, you can look at your whole organization and buy their diary and all the rest of it. You can say, well, actually nobody took a lunch break this week. So I do think that mm -hmm. voice of the employee backed with data yeah, yeah. can actually help, you know, really yeah. um, uh, can make the right decisions. And I think the role of the manager becomes so important. And we need, really need to support that management, first line management community, um, to really make sure they've got the, the skills to kind of manage in this hybrid world okay. is super, super important. It is, because I also think they are ultimately the bridge between For sure. the, the C-suite, who, who may still have the want and the perception to... People in the building. People in the building. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then to the employees who, who, who have their own wants. And, they're the bridge in the middle, aren't they? Yeah, and I think you know, a lot of this comes down to, to trust. I mean, most organizations will say there was no, like yeah, productivity was, was, mm. was fantastic, right? Mm. So if the element there of like there's trust, mm. right, then mm. why which comes wouldn't, down to values again. which comes down to values, why wouldn't we encourage flexibility? And to be frankly honest, I think our employees will say, well, if that's not what works, I'll yeah. find someplace else where it will. Exactly. The, w the health and well-being you, you touched on, and, and, and it's something that I, I'm witnessing at the moment, is that I think as we're emerging from the pandemic and as people are beginning to have to, again, juggle more, yeah. you know, juggle more social engagements or, or the commute or whatever it may be, it's almost like we've forgotten mm -hmm. how to deal with those pressures. And I think it's creeping up on people. Yeah. Are, are you seeing that? Um, I think... I think, yeah, it really depends on whether, you know, people are being mandated back to an office or not. I think back on, I mean, there is, you know, there's a, a lot of our employees, you know, that have the kind of younger kids, like they want to be able, like they got used to be able to walk the kid, your kid to school, mm. right? Then I, I think they, there isn't, they don't want to compromise or give that up. And I think that's totally fair. Yeah. So I think it's about like... What, the working week, now for some jobs it does, but for a lot, it doesn't necessarily, the working day have to be nine to five. No, no. I think it's about when people can get their work done and having that flexibility. Yeah. I think if we can, and that's, you know, that's not gonna happen overnight. If we can all work together, we'll manage this kind of pressures of 
oh God, now I can't take my kid to school or I'm two hours because I have to be in for this day. Mm. I think we just need to figure it out. And I think we need to not be so hard on ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. like this is a journey. Um, there's days when things won't go that well. There's other days where God, you know, I've got great flexibility. So I think it's about continuously looking at it, talking about it for employers, employees, having the forums, learning, being curious and figuring it out as we go along, honestly. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and talking about it, communicating and making sure that, yeah, people are okay. Yeah, and, and I, like, I say to a lot of, of um, my colleagues, you also have to figure out a way to create time and space for health and well-being. Yeah. Because like, I, I really create time in my diary to do the gym. I could have no time in my diary for it, but I just build it in and figure a way out to do it. Because mm. that's really, when you have mm. the energy mm. I have, if I don't mm. get rid of it someplace, yeah. It could probably it's be come out in the wrong way. <laughs> destructive for sure. So I think you just have to kind of build stuff in that yeah. you don't want to compromise in your diary and, and work through it. But I think everyone's trying to figure it out, to be honest, Sinead. No, I think they are. And I mean, I think this brings to another point you touched on. So the use of technology to probably help with these pressures, with these ability to juggle with the global resourcing issue that we were talking yep. about before camera. Um, and I know Microsoft are, are, are heavy into that as to how they think they can help yeah, us Yeah, we, we, as I said, we, we did chat off camera about this. So this is around like accessibility. Yeah. So, you know, there is a huge challenge um, globally, right, for people mm. and resources, mm. right? Um, and I'm not just sure that's going to change anytime soon. And therefore, we have to start looking to parts of society that maybe mm -hmm. before we thought we well, you know, couldn't do these mm -hmm. jobs. And mm -hmm. that's twofold. One is on parts of society that can be retrained and, and upskilled. Mm -hmm. um, and we've done a program during COVID, um, Step Into Tech, where we've been working through nearly, our aim is to put 10,000 people in Ireland through this program. And they're like people from more the traditional industries. Um, we've, we, I only met this fantastic uh, man from Nigeria living in Sligo, who's a bus driver, who's just gone through, got his cloud accreditations. Okay. Like, amazing, Fantastic, amazing. Yeah. So, you know, the, P, there's you know, parts of society that, you know, can enter into, in our scenario, the tech world, they just need the access to the training. We've yeah. partnered with some of the ETBs to do that. So that's one part of society yeah. that we need to look and say, well, why have we never, you know, and we just need to give them accessibility to the courses, help and support and funding, right? Yeah. That's one. The second around uh, more in the accessibility is, you know, people that have, you know, um, disabilities, yeah. right? You know, whatever they may be. Well, there are certain things now that we can build into technology, which means they can enter the, into the workforce. And okay. there are over a billion people globally, right, with disabilities. And they're... Who maybe traditionally... Who traditionally looked and said, do you know what, they, they're just... They, we would never consider them. Okay. But actually, well, what we're building into our technology, okay. they can now start to enter into the workforce. And that's a really, really massive focus um, for Microsoft. And, and, you know, it'll keep getting maturing over the coming years. But just think if we can open up globally a whole new workforce. Mm. I mean, and that's mm. what we're going to have to do. Shane. We're going to have to look to different parts of society well, right, well, to try, try and is. figure this out. So yeah. at the moment, I think, everybody's looking into the same pool to go, well, there's like there's the same number of fishes swimming around. We've just got to start to look and think differently. And it's, yeah. you know, it is a global problem. Yeah, it is. And therefore, I think, you know, we just need, um, you know, globally to tackle it. But from a Microsoft, it's, it's, it's just incredible what, we're, what I'm seeing coming down the line that will be built into technology. And I think over time, you know, this can be really exciting. Is the pace going quicker? So if you look at the journey of, that's a huge question, I know, but if the journey of technology in the last 20 years and where we've gone from A to B is B I think to this C, is going to be much quicker. quicker is yeah, it? yeah, much quicker, absolutely. So, so um, and our, some of the technology, without going into kind of the, the, oh, the whole technical thing, yeah. I think the pace, particularly in accessibility, of what we're seeing coming out in the technology, I think is going to be fast and it needs to be. And is Ireland at the cutting edge of that innovation or what role I don't do you know, play? Well, I mean, I think, I think Microsoft is. I yeah. mean, we're doing some work you'll have seen with Enable Ireland. Yes, right? I saw that. Yeah. So I think, you know, what we want to do is play our part in some of kind of the testing of the technology and make sure we can do, um, you know, play our part from an Ireland perspective. Mm -hmm. I think some of the stuff that we're doing, um, particularly around STEM and what we're doing mm -hmm. um, with, um, you know, kids in primary and secondary mm -hmm. level, I, I think we're leading the way. Mm -hmm. Um, we being Microsoft, uh, Microsoft yeah. yeah, well, what we're doing in the Irish market compared to what I see in some other markets, for sure, we're leading the way there. Yeah. 
And that brings me nicely on to, I suppose, my third topic that I wanted to talk to you about, and it's the whole D&I space, or, yeah. or the I and D space, or the D and I and E space. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, I love it. I love it. It kind of changes. I know it's a passion of yours. Yeah. I know it's a passion of Microsoft. And we've talked yeah. about how Microsoft are, are, are doing the Enable Ireland. Um, but, 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 but it is a passion of yours, and, and I know Pride, it's this June is Pride Month. Yeah, and, Microsoft and I've been an LGBT ally for years and years and years. And um, we have our big celebrations on the 23rd of June. And it kind of comes back to, look, whatever anybody's orientation is, mm. right? It goes back to my original point about, you know, come as you are, do as you love, mm. right? Mm. And I just want people to you know, when they're in the workplace, just to be who they are, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we've hired them into Microsoft, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think when somebody can be relaxed, be themselves, you surely get the best out of them. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, because somebody said to me recently in an interview, you know, um, you know, have you to pretend to be something you're not? And I'm like, well, I'm not an actress. If it was an actress, I'd be an actress, right? And I, I mean, I often years ago got feedback to say, God, Anne, you're great. If you could just be a bit like everybody else. And I'd like literally <laughs> Sinead try for a day and then it'd be too much energy. I'd be like, do you know what? I'm going back to speaking fast, yeah. all the rest of it. Yeah. So I think it's too much bloody energy yeah. to be something you're not, yeah. right? So I just love, I find it so refreshing when I go into the Microsoft campus and you just see, I, I don't know, it's just- 71 nationalities, I believe. Oh, 71 nationalities, yeah. right? Everybody being themselves, I just love it. I get an yeah. energy that's just um, electrics. That's on pride. Yeah. On the kind of STEM, um, we have, which was started, which was, uh, you know, under Katrina's mm. leadership was what we call dream space. And that was started back in 2018. Mm -hmm. And that is around, well, first of all, it was to, to address all kind of STEM in, in primary and secondary mm -hmm. schools. So mm -hmm. to give kids in Ireland access mm -hmm. to kind of digital assets, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you know the, the aim at the time was to kind of put 80,000 students and we're at 120,000 students. And I won't tell you now, but I've set a big, a big target that we'll announce okay. in the next while okay. where um, you know we were just going to really supersize that over the next few years. That has Brilliant. been pretty incredible yeah. because that is across, you know, we've had the DESH schools and on DESH yeah. schools and every day, even this week I've been when I've been in the building, there is like kids in and it's so meaningful and they're exposed mm -hmm. to the programs. We've had a particular focus, like it is for all kids, mm -hmm. but we've had a particular focus on females. females yeah. And there was an incredible, it was a girl, uh, absolutely incredible from Clondalkin in one of the schools there who wanted to be a nail technician. She'd been through dream space and was suddenly like, I think I could do this. And has now gone on to um, one of the colleges to do something in computer science. I mean, quite, Fab. like it's every day. Fab. I was with, um, uh, speaking at something last week and three or four people came up to me afterwards and was like, our kids have been to dream space. And during COVID, obviously when they mm. physically couldn't come mm. to the building, the team partner with RT Junior and we're live and, and right. that was just incredible. Yeah. Um, we're about to launch Dream Space in Northern Ireland and it's just, but it's giving kids access, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, that where in some of the schools they just don't have access yeah, and, and, those, it, and it's a program and it's just so meaningful, yeah. And those, that generation, I mean, they just take to technology like a duck to water. So they need to have the access. For sure, for yeah. sure. They do take to technology, which is incredible, right? But then it's about the programs, though, Sinead, around exposing them to, you know, to, you know, to digital assets, to, co to okay. kind of computer science, to so math. The deeper. So the deeper, yeah. you know, um, that's where we, we really focus on through Dream Space. Fantastic. Because it's not about like, you know, they love using, they'll all have a Surface or they'll have an iPad or whatever the case may be, right? This is about going a bit deeper okay. and having a more structured program. Okay. Um, you know, we've full-time teachers employed, they're incredible. Um, and, yeah. and it's just to see the desire and, and the desire from the schools, right? Because yeah. they don't have, you know, this isn't really built into the curriculum, which you know, well, probably should yeah, be. Yeah. Um, so for me, that just makes my day every day that I pass. And, and we just, you know, for me, um, I want to make sure that we kind of supersize that as we go through the next few years. That's brilliant. I'll look out for that announcement. Touching on females in STEM, a question that I, I, I have to ask someone who's a female leader who's got to your position. Ch uh, advantage, disadvantage to being a female? Have, have, you, have you noticed, have you had any difference throughout your journey? Um, it's a great question um, because I, I've been very fortunate, mm -hmm. right? Because actually 
you know, kind of growing up in the early part of my career in IBM, IBM was probably one, at the time, one of the front leaders in diversity. Okay. Um, and really took a, you know, under Sam Pamasano and then Ginny Rometty, um, you know, was always, I think had KPIs, awful word, for, you know, kind of percentage of females when okay. nobody else had, right? Okay. In saying that though, I think probably my first 10 years, I, I, I most of the time was the only female. Mm -hmm. And I felt, the one thing I would have said, so I was I never felt a disadvantage mm -hmm. to me in getting promotions or anything. I, I felt, you know, in IBM, you truly were evaluated on your ability, which was fantastic. And I had brilliant mentors. Okay. Some in Ireland, like Peter O'Neill, who was the former CEO, great mentor, Dave Cornick, like that is, would still be mentors um, of mine. But I, d I always felt that I had to make an impact in my first two minutes, probably more than maybe some of my male counterparts. So if I was presenting, it was yeah. like, I've got to land, I've got to make an impression in the first okay. two minutes or I'll be just like, okay. slightly so. Whether that was my own personal yeah, view yeah, yeah, or my... whether I just, and I, so I, I really worked on that art of like, okay, if I'm opening a presentation well, or I'm you meeting- your high energy. Maybe, or yeah. I'm meeting a customer for the first time or I'm presenting internally in IBM for the first time, I have to just really make this impact and kind of own the room in the first two, three minutes. So I worked probably a lot on that. So whether that was a kind of psyche of because I was female, I don't know, yeah? Yeah, no, it's, it, it's hard and, 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 and uh, yeah, it's hard to say whether it, it, it helped or, or didn't help, but there definitely is a difference. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned mentors, but you also mentioned strong female role models for sure so so it is e not easier but it's important for females to be able to see the role yeah. models and that's why someone like you is so important well, thank you i don't know if no. i'm a role model but, but even I, I you know i remember um when i started in ibm first there was this lady mary gleason who was running i think the pc company in ireland actually mm. and i remember going wow mm. so i think i probably there was all i always was able to spot females that were mm. a few levels ahead of me going, isn't that just incredible? So there was mm. always, so I was really fortunate that like, mm. as I said, in IBM and, and in Vodafone the same, like mm. to get the opportunity mm. to work with, with Anne in, in Vodafone was, mm -hmm. was incredible. And I was part of a team where the leadership team in Ireland was 70% female. That's right, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I think still might be. Yeah. Sorry, Anne, if I've got the wrong stats there, but, um, and that was incredible actually, yeah. where, yeah. you know, the, the start of the meeting wasn't about football. I think I got my passion for sport actually because maybe I grew up in a in a male where I was so used to like, you know, talking about. But you're still an ace golfer. Sorry. You're still playing golf. No, no, you? I'm not a golfer. You're no, not, not, no, no, no. That's another member of your family. Yeah. Oh, okay. Very good. Um, listen, I'm really conscious of time, but I I I, I want to kind of finish up with you know, what advice would you have for the twenty-something-year-old starting off now in their career? Yeah. Uh, male or female? What advice would you give them? I think few things, um, no particular order. I think one just, and I, maybe, I know when you're younger, you don't really know who you are, but kind of try to figure out the things that you really stand for and the mm -hmm. things that you don't, because that helps you when you're trying to choose what company you want to work for or what industry. So kind of, you know, spend a bit of time, you know, what feels right in your heart or your gut, mm -hmm. right? Of like, these are the things I really like doing mm -hmm. and these are the things I don't. And, and, and kind of don't compromise on that because there's nothing, I, I have friends who've spent years in organizations or companies that didn't really like it. And I'm like, why would you mm -hmm. do that? Mm -hmm. So I think kind of trying to know yourself and always taking the time as you go, or you, you know, you get older or more mature, or more experienced to kind of, you know, just check that every now and then. Am I, are my values still the same? Is that still how I feel? Am I compromising mm -hmm. stuff? I mean, life's about compromise. I'm not saying mm -hmm. you can't compromise, mm -hmm. but am I compromising too much? So I think kind of knowing that is is super important. The second, I don't know whether you'll agree that is, don't overthink your career. Mm, yeah. I meet some people and they're just like, yeah. but I need to be here, you know. Yeah. I was like, I obviously just, I never thought about my next role in any Go role I was in. The terms. I was like, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to nail it. I'm going to build a great team and I'm going to make my customers as happy as I can be. And then the next role will figure itself out. And it does. Yeah. If yeah. you overthink your career, honestly, you just put a stress and a pressure and it's wasted energy. Mm. So I'm not saying not to have a kind of a career plan and have some idea, but just don't overthink it. Absolutely. Yeah? And I think the third is do take the time to kind of network and get mentors, but don't get a mentor because you're looking for your next job. Get a mentor because you genuinely want someone to bounce stuff off um, and, you know, a kind of an ear, you know, so mm -hmm. use it. If you're going to have a mentor, use them in a way a mentor is meant to be used, mm -hmm. right? 
And I think, you know, networking is super important. Yeah. Yeah. And I view a network as in every time I meet somebody for the first time, I'm like, well, maybe they can be somebody that I can can help me in the future. And mm -hmm. therefore, when people come to me for help, I always try and help them because that's yeah. it works. Yeah. It works um, both ways. So I think that kind of network and, and building a mentor community is important. And then the last is feedback's a gift. You have feedback's to be able to take feedback. I've always been a massive absorber of feedback. Which when, can be hard. When times when I've gone, oh my, because I'm like a sensitive old soul, me, yeah. where you just go, oh, sore, yeah. hard. Yeah. Uh, but it's a gift. Yeah. And to this yeah. day, I, I say to my team, you know, any feedback, um, because you don't learn if you nice. don't, and, and it toughens you up. Oh, it does. Yeah. Nice. They are four fab pieces of advice. Um, and your passion, your energy is infectious and never, ever <laughs> use that. You're amazing. Um, I, wanna... I feel like you should do a Terry Wogan, this is your life. Ed. I know, I know. I'd love to. I'd love to. But those red books. What I do want to say is, I'm going to say it down the camera, is you're not allowed to leave Grant Thornton and go to Microsoft because <laughs> she's made it so attractive and I know that. But no, well done. Mm. A fabulous career, fabulous role model. And look, looking forward to what Microsoft can bring um, to, to, to the global, uh, you know, re revitalization of the global Thank of the workforce. Yeah. Thanks a million. Thank I appreciate you, it hugely. Yeah, I really appreciate it. So again, thanks a million to Anne for the time she spent with us today. And, and thank you to everyone who has actually stayed to watch this to the end. Um, there's some huge learnings in, in, in this session. Uh, the Leaders' Lounge is something we're trying to do to get insights from the leading professionals in, in Ireland. And um, I hope you enjoyed today's session and we look forward to the next one.